Once attackers compromise a system or maybe multiple systems on a network, they almost always want to establish some form of persistence. Right? Adversaries want their malware and their access to survive things like a system reboot, or evade remediation efforts, or in general just allow them to re-enter the environment and continue their actions on objectives. Right? It's very rare these days to find an intrusion that does not involve some form of persistence. Now the good news is, is that there's you know, a set number of techniques out there that adversaries like to gravitate to uh, when it comes to establishing persistence. And so in this video, we'll focus on hunting for evidence of some of the most common methods out there. Now we'll start with one of the most common and tried and true persistence mechanisms out there, uh, and that's using auto start locations. Right, for well over a decade, attackers have relied on various registry locations to implant their malware. And even today, you know, they continue to use these techniques because they work, right? And they still work even after all of this time. Why fix what isn't broken? Right? And while there are you know, heaps of different registry keys that can be used for this purpose, uh, we typically find the most commonly abused locations are in things like the H key current user uh, hive, specifically under the run key or the run once key, which you can find under software, Microsoft, Windows, current version, and then run or run once. Now again, these registry keys or locations can also be found in the user's ntuser.dat file, which is that user specific registry file located in the user's profile directory. Now we also have HKLM or the HK local machine keys, which again, you can find under software, Microsoft, Windows, current version, and then under run or run once, right? And again, these can also be found in the software hive file located in C colon slash windows slash system 32 slash config. Now, if an attacker can get their malware or their script or binary or command, you know, whatever into any of these registry keys as sort of a pointer, they can ensure that it runs automatically every time the system starts or the user logs in, granting them persistence across reboots. Now, the key differences between H key current user and H key local machine in the case of these uh, auto start locations is in the fact that H key current user, for example, is user specific. Right, so if an attacker compromises a specific user's account and drops their entry into any one of those keys, uh, the malware is only going to run when that user logs in. Which is in contrast to H key local machine, which is, as the name suggests, machine or system wide, right? Meaning that the malware will execute whenever any user logs in. Now again, we also have differences between run and run once. And so entries in the run key are going to be executed anytime the system starts up. Typically, again, when a user logs in for H key current user uh, or at system startup for any user for H key local machine. Now, entries in run once are only going to be executed once, right? As the name suggests here, right? The program's going to run and then it's going to be automatically removed from the registry after that execution. And so in general, again, these auto start locations are a great place to start when hunting for persistence uh, during a threat hunt or an investigation of any size. And while I mentioned that this is only kind of a starting point and that there are many other possible locations for malware to hide in the registry, um, you know, we have very powerful tools like the Sys Internals Auto Run Suite, which can automatically enumerate and identify all of these locations and then some. Right? And we'll take a look at that in a moment. But we can also use a number of powerful baselining techniques with auto runs in the command line uh, to identify compromised systems remotely and at scale. And so it's very powerful. And if you want to walk through the sort of process in a hands on way, be sure to check out the SOC 101 course on the TCM Academy where we do just that. And so, for example, let's say that I've compromised this system here as the attacker, and I want to install some persistent backdoors uh, in, in the form of auto start registry entries. Right? And so what I can do is use some living off the land techniques uh, in the form of the reg add command, right? So running reg.exe, uh, in this case, to add an additional registry entry on this system. And so what I'll do here is paste in uh, that registry you know, key location uh, to that current user and then that run uh, key, as you can see here, right? And then for the name of the registry uh, key that I'm adding, I'm going to call it print service installer to sort of blend into the noise. Uh, and then for the uh, sort of data that I'm inputting, uh, I'm pointing it over to uh, this print service installer.exe file uh, that I've implanted into the C colon slash windows directory. Right, so I'll just hit slash F there to force that. And you can see that the operation was completed successfully. Right, and so we've now added that entry in the form of an auto start entry under the current user uh, under that run key. And so, for example, you know, we could start going through uh, things like Registry Explorer and start opening that up and going through the registry in that case. Uh, or what we could do is run something like auto runs. Right? And so let me just open this up. 
And if we just give this a second to load, we can see almost immediately uh, that it's highlighting the print service installer here uh, in red, right? And in fact, I can go under logon here, which is just going to filter just to those uh, registry entries, right? And we can see here the path of HK current user uh, under the run key. We have that print service installer, which is highlighting up in red uh, because it is not a verified file. But again, uh, we're enumerating all of those different uh, registry entries here. And what we could do, of course, you know, we right click on this, look at the properties of this entry. Uh, we can see what it's pointing to, right? We can see different details about it, uh, the, the underlying binary. Uh, and again, this isn't going to be an entirely uh, auto runs focused uh, lesson here, but, uh, you know, we can do a number of interesting things using auto runs. Gain a competitive edge with industry recognized TCM security certifications. Our certifications are acknowledged by leading cyber professionals and organizations worldwide. Equip yourself with credentials that speak volumes in the cybersecurity community. Elevate your professional standing at certifications.tcm-sec.com. Be recognized and be respected. And so next, another very commonly abused persistence mechanism on Windows systems uh, are services, right? And now services, again, on Windows are kind of similar to Unix daemons, right? They're sort of these background processes that are designed to run in the background without any kind of user interaction. And they also typically, uh, in most cases, run with higher privileges or maybe specialized privileges and can be configured uh, to run during system boot, right? Or uh, whenever the system starts up or even on user logon. Right. Um, they're also sometimes pretty fault tolerant, right? So if they fail, they can automatically be configured to restart, right? Um, and so with all these facts in mind, you can kind of see why attackers might want to be drawn uh, to abusing services for persistence. They're almost like custom built for persistence mechanisms, if you believe it or not. Um, now, there's a huge number of default services on Windows systems, and it's not really practical to go through each one with a fine tooth comb. And so again, like with auto start entries, we can use utilities like these sys internals auto runs to help us out in enumerating these services on the system, right? And we can document things like the image path, uh, the user account in which the service runs under, um, and other configuration details and really help us identify abnormalities. Especially when we start comparing, uh, you know, maybe a compromised system services uh, to a known clean or a known good image, right? We can very quickly use baselining techniques to hunt for evil. And this becomes even more important uh, when we think about all the different ways in which services can be abused on Windows systems to achieve persistence. Right? So for example, the easiest way is just for an attacker to create a brand new service. Right? And this is effective because again, services are generally trusted uh, and run in the background without requiring user interaction. And once the service is created, again, it can be configured to run under different user contacts or different privileges like system or local service uh, and basically give the attacker flexibility to escalate their access as needed. Now, a step up in sort of stealth here from simply creating a new service is replacing or hijacking an existing one, right? Instead of actually adding something new on the system, an attacker can just find an existing service, uh, you know, especially if it's one that's been disabled or maybe rarely run or used, uh, and they can basically just modify that again to point to their malware, or their malicious binary or script or command, uh, whatever it is that they want to have run on a regular basis. And this technique also makes that baseline detection a little bit more difficult. Right. Um, you know, the service name and the registry entry might not appear to be unchanged from a service that already existed, right? Because the attacker is just exploiting or altering an existing service. And so we might need to go a little bit more beyond as defenders uh, to maybe look at, um, you know, service state or the service type uh, and things like the associated binaries uh, to catch this form of persistence. Now, an even more stealthy persistence mechanism here with services uh, is abusing things like the service failure and recovery settings. And so services, uh, if you think about it, are often very critical to the operating system, right? Uh, and so Windows needs to know what to do if one of the critical services fail. And so, for example, if the Windows event log service fails, well, the system's going to need to restart. And so it can make sure uh, it's still, you know, maintaining that integrity with event logs, right? You can't just have the Windows event log service fail and the system continue to run. And so like with everything we talked about so far, this built-in failover state can be abused by attackers to maintain persistence. And so, for example, I can head over to services.msc, which is going to be that snap-in that we can use to interact with uh, and view and enumerate different services on the system. And so, for example, I'll just scroll down here and find one that's not currently running uh, just so I can edit the properties. So I'll just right click and click on properties here. And if I head over to the recovery tab that you can see here, uh, we have um, different actions that we can take. Right. And so for the first failure, uh, for example, in this case, it's going to try to restart the service. I can change this to actually run a program. 
right? And so from down here, I can select the actual program that I want to run. And so what I can do is head over to uh, maybe the Windows folder again, where I've, uh, you know, stashed some malware, and I can point it over to WoW64 Updater, which is, again is just a fake malware file uh, that I've implanted here. And we can have that run uh, any time that this service fails to start, right? And so we can take advantage and exploit uh, that failure recovery uh, effort and, and run whatever program we want. And we can even include whatever command line parameters we want to run as well. And so if I hit apply and save, uh, we've now sort of manually uh, adjusted that file there or that service uh, to run our own file. Now, along with services, we can't forget about scheduled tasks, right? Basically a way for us in Windows to schedule something, whether it be a program or a binary or a script or some kind of command, right? Uh, to basically run in the future. Now with scheduled tasks, like with cron jobs on Unix based systems, we often think about temporal scheduling, right? And that we can run a scheduled task at a certain time or interval. However, that's not the only trigger that we can set for scheduled tasks in Windows, right? We can also set them up to trigger on specific events, like when someone logs into the system, right? And so again, this is another mechanism that attackers like to use, or rather abuse, uh, to achieve persistence. And at its simplest form, an attacker can just create a brand new scheduled task that launches their malware on startup or on login, or, or again, even on specific time intervals. Now for this example, again, I've compromised the system, I'm working as the attacker here, and maybe this time I want to establish persistence using scheduled tasks, right? And so again, we can live off the land a bit here and just run the SCH tasks command or the schedule task command, right? The Windows task scheduler. And this time I'm going to create a task. I'm gonna call it Windows update service. You can see I'm pointing it again over to that WoW64 updater malware file. And then for the schedule here, I'm gonna call it on logon and then slash F there to force the change. You can see here that we've created this scheduled task. And if I head back over to auto runs, basically just do a refresh here and head over to scheduled tasks, we should be able to find the Windows update service task that we just created. And again, these same sort of steps apply. We can uh, you know, look into the binary that's being run. Uh, we can look at things like the schedule of when it's being run and all of the different configurations all through uh, the auto runs utility. Now, an interesting curveball in the form of uh, persistence mechanisms is the concept of WMI event consumers. Now, these aren't talked about as often as some of the other common methods here, uh, but they can be extremely stealthy uh, if you don't know what you're looking for on a system. And so unlike registry or service or schedule task persistence, which sort of leaves more obvious artifacts on the file system, WMI persistence lives deeper uh, or lower in the system and is sort of harder to detect, again, unless you know where to look. Now, this could be an entire video on its own. It really could, but uh, the core principle here is that WMI or Windows Management Instrumentation uh, allows administrators and attackers uh, to create permanent event subscriptions that monitor for system specific uh, events and then trigger an action when those events occur. And again, this mechanism can often be used for persistence. Right? An attacker can set up their own subscription so that when a trigger event happens, like maybe a user logging in or system booting up, a malicious payload or whatever the attacker wants to run can be executed. Now, WMI event consumers uh, basically have three different components that work together. Now we have the event filter, which defines what event will trigger the action, right? Again, it could be things like system startup or user logon. Uh, honestly, the amount of different WMI events are in the thousands, right? Uh, they can be temporal or again, time-based triggers, uh, or maybe when a certain file exists on the system or when a certain directory exists or is created. Um, it could be even things like hardware triggers like CPU utilization, right? Or fan speeds, right? <laughs> the list kind of goes on here. Now, the second aspect we need is the event consumer itself, right? So uh, really how we define what actions to take, right? Are we running a script? Uh, are we maybe running PowerShell or CMD.exe and calling a command, uh, you know, executing some kind of command? And so the consumer is really just whatever happens uh, when that filter is triggered, right? And commonly when it's abused, we'll see things like a binary or executable being run, uh, maybe a PowerShell script or some kind of PowerShell command, uh, or maybe a Visual Basic or VB script. Now, the third and final component we need here uh, is the filter to consumer binding, right? We need to bind that filter and consumer together to create the WMI event consumer. And these three items are gonna be basically compiled into the WMI repository on the system, which again, gives the adversary a very stealthy backdoor that runs whenever the event is triggered. And I think this is a very important persistence mechanism to talk about because it is so simple to uh, sort of execute. And a lot of organizations aren't monitoring or auditing for this, right? It can be very stealthy if you're not looking inside those WMI repositories and looking for those consumers or those bindings between filters and consumers. 
Now let's run through a quick example of creating and then hunting for a malicious WMI event consumer. And so my desktop here, I have this WMI.ps1 file. We don't really need to look at this in depth, but really what this is doing is just creating those three different components for us, right? We have the event filter, the event consumer, and then we're binding those two together. And how this works really, if we look at the query within the filter arguments here, is that it's going to check things like the last boot up time. Uh, so it can ensure, uh, you know, whether it's indicative of the system starting up. And if so, uh, basically on boot, it's going to call um, the payload within that event consumer that we've created. And if you want to get your hands on the script, I will just have a link for it on my GitHub down in the description. So if you want to recreate this, uh, but really we're just going to run the script to create that event consumer, and then we'll showcase how we can hunt for it. Right. So what I'll do here is open up PowerShell as administrator. Then I'll just set the execution policy to bypass so I can run the script. Just hit A there to say yes to all. And then from here, I'm just going to run uh, that WMI.ps1 script. Right? And so what I'll do is just dot source that and then run WMI.ps1. We should get a nice message here in a second saying that the event consumer was created. Right. So now that's been completed. Now, again, to hunt for malicious WMI event consumers, we can't just look through the file system, right? Or things like services or scheduled tasks uh, to find these artifacts. The best way, honestly, to audit these events uh, is to actually look through PowerShell, right? Uh, specifically the get WMI object uh, commandlet that we have uh, to allow us to query the Windows Management Instrumentation or WMI uh, in order uh, to pull back information about different system components, or in this case, the event consumers. And in most cases, we will have some false positives or uh, really just benign event consumers that come up when we run these queries, right? And that's normal. That's normal within Windows. But the legitimate ones will typically be more consistent uh, and sort of easy for us to filter out. Again, this is really one of the easiest places to go hunting for persistence if we know what we're looking for. And so really, we just have to run the get dash WMI object commandlet that you can see here. And this is going to allow us to enumerate all of the filters and consumers and bindings. Right. So, for example, uh, with this syntax here, I'm looking for the event consumers. If I wanted to search for the event filters, well, I could just change the syntax slightly like that. And if I wanted to grab those bindings, again, I can just search for the filter to consumer binding. Now, in this case, it's usually best to start out by looking for the consumers, right? As that's going to be more verbose in uh, the fact that it's going to tell us what's actually being run when it's triggered, right? And so, for example, if I just run event consumer, and just hit run here, it's going to print out. In this case, it looks like we just have one or two here that have been sort of returned for us, right? Um, and then again, now if we find anything interesting, uh, you know, we can start to map uh, its different trigger or its filter uh, and its binding to complete that full picture. Remember those three different parts. And so if I scroll up, um, you know, we should be able to find something particularly interesting, right? The first thing here is that uh, if we look at the class, this is a command line event consumer, right? And these are one of the ones that we want to sort of pay attention to uh, because again, in this case, if we look at the command line template, uh, in this case, we're running that payload. We have what looks to be some suspicious PowerShell, right? Uh, we're running, or, you know, we're opening a hidden window here. Uh, we're running IEX to basically download uh, a file from this suspicious URL and then execute it, right, using IEX. And so again, a very simple but very common example here of how these WMI event consumers can be used uh, to run things like a download cradle or some sort of persistence or maybe a beacon or some kind of command and control uh, agent, right? And basically any kind of trigger that we want, right? In this case, on system boot. And that's all we have time for today. And so I hope you enjoyed the video. Like I said, uh, we really only started to scratch the surface of the potential uh, amount of persistence mechanisms out there, but we did really focus and cover uh, the most common ones that you'll see in the field. And so if you did want to get more hands-on, if you enjoy this kind of thing, um, if you want to maybe uh, learn how you can exploit these persistence mechanisms or uh, maybe go hunting for them like we did today, uh, I encourage you to check out the TCM Security Academy where we have numerous courses on both offensive uh, or defensive security, which I think you'll really enjoy. Now again, uh, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, if you did, be sure to leave a like on the video uh, and subscribe for more just like this.